mulata. Camina así. Ay, mamita, camina, anda. Camina así. Dale un poquito para acá. Camina así. Today, I have the sheer pleasure of introducing you to one of the premier broadcast voices of our time. This woman has been doing radio for a long, 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 long time. And you have heard her voice on many, many, many commercials all over the country. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Pat Prescott. Hello, Lydia. How are so you? Good to be here. Oh, you don't know. I'm so excited <laughs> to have you. Where did you grow up in? I grew up in Hampton, Virginia. Okay. And when I was uh, in high school, my dad was a boys club director. He got offered a job directing a boys club in Bedford Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. Wow. And so we moved to Brooklyn. And so I went to high school at Thomas Jefferson there. And when I graduated, I went to Northwestern University. Wow. I uh, got a full scholarship there and majored in English and secondary ed. And I was on the path to become a teacher. And what shifted you into radio? Well, I started uh, teaching in New Orleans. My uh, college boyfriend was from New Orleans. Okay. It made sense at the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Met someone who was coordinating hostesses for the Natra Convention, which was oh, wow. in New Orleans that summer. I knew, had never heard of Natra before. And Natra was National Association of Television Radio Association? Announcers. Announcers. Yeah, that was the, the black announcers. Right. Uh, organization and so they were looking for people you know to meet people at the airport and to host some of the receptions and that kind of thing and so I said sure and so while I was there I got a chance to to see firsthand what the business looked like or at least what the people in the business looked like all the top jocks were there from across the country Frankie Crocker uh, JJ Jeffries Jocko uh, you know everybody so after that week was over you know I could see this looked like a really cool thing to do and uh, I figured if these were the top disc jockeys in the country I knew I could do that so I looked in the yellow pages which is what the way we did it yes. back then <laughs> and I found a broadcasting school because even though I went to Northwestern University which has one of the premier radio TV and film schools in the country I never walked in the building wow. the whole time I was in school because that was not what I was doing. And so I needed to learn something. So I went to a broadcasting school, got very fortunate, met someone who was uh, in my class who was renewing um, a license, who was a program director at a station in Mississippi. And he knew a program director at one of the stations in uh, New Orleans, whose name was Anthony Wilson, and Anthony Wilson, the program director at WYLD FM in New York at the time, gave me YLD my first break. YLD in New Orleans. In New Orleans. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. But I got an offer to come to WRVR wow. and to do the overnights there, and I came in, and after about, I guess, six months, I got the opportunity to do the midday show. Wow, and RVR was the jazz uh, station Correct. in New York. Yes, wow. Riverside Broadcasting. It's a, a legendary jazz station, and that was uh, my first opportunity in New York. And then from there, you went to... WRVR changed format. They changed from jazz to country and western, like oh. overnight, which was super <laughs> exciting, which was a really important lesson for me, which was because I was having a great time loving what I was doing, you know, putting my whole life into my job. But when that happened, that with that format change, that was my first real look at the business of mm -hmm. the music business. Mm -hmm. And to understand, <laughs> you don't own the station, you don't, you know, you just are here because they hired you and whatever they want to do, they can do it. But I felt like I was diverse enough to do other things. So I worked at the National Black Network. I did news there because mm -hmm. I could write. So I worked there for a while and also got a part-time job at WBLS. I had to go to, and this is where I first met you, yes. because that was, Frankie Crocker was the one yes. who hired me, and you were like Frankie's little assistant or mascot or something, I don't know, you were just a little kid. I got in the door because awesome. of Frankie, I stayed <laughs> in the place because of Wanda, I learned everything because of Hal. Well, you know what yes. a great environment that was. Yeah, yes, it was. Uh, you know, Hal was also, Hal Jackson, very, very influential to me someone who was really encouraging and helpful. But that opportunity that Frankie Crocker gave me really just opened the door for me. And I remember when I first went to him, first of all, it took forever to see him, as you can imagine, because mm -hmm. you know, he would make an appointment and then they would cancel the appointment. And then so finally I got to go. And when I came, he had me come and sit in the studio and I sat in the back while he sat, sat there in the dark and did his show and handled his business <laughs> on the phone and all that. We went to the Chinese restaurant. There was a million people around. I'm like, 
this doesn't feel like a job interview to me. So after I'd been there for about three hours or so, I, I said, well, I'm going to have to leave now. And he says, okay, well, you start next week. That was a great break for me, and I will always really be the, thankful. The fact that he took you to the Chinese that. restaurant <laughs> meant he liked you. I worked part-time. And I worked for Frankie when he wasn't there. And as you know, he was the Johnny Carson of radio. Right. He was not there a lot. So right. you got a chance to get a lot of exposure. And then eventually I got the job doing the mornings. But I also did news at WLIB while I was there too. Wow. I've I didn't always, know that. yeah, did news and did a public affairs talk show. Because I always felt like I wanted to be able to do more things. Yes. I that think. has helped me a lot through my career. When things change, you can That's still true. have a, a job. Because radio is musical chairs. One minute, you're up. The next minute, we've decided we're going another direction. Exactly. So. But that's been good for me, too, on the formatic side because a lot of people associate me with jazz, but I've done a lot of work in R&B and in pop also. While I was in New Orleans, um, I worked at one of the, the top rock stations there for about six to eight months. That was about all I could take, and I went <laughs> I went back to WYLD. But that was a great opportunity for me because it's something I could put on my resume and something that I then had experience with. And I think that being able to go from, to do more than one format, uh, to be able to do talk shows and conduct interviews and to be able to edit and you know, put a public affairs show together. The, the fact that I can do all those things, I think, is a reason why 40 years after I took a sabbatical leave from teaching, I'm still doing this thing. <laughs> And it's amazing to me sometimes. And you also have a voice that is nondescript in a way that your voice can can be anywhere. You know, some people, their voice is so distinct that, that it's hard for them to cross over into other genres. Your voice is easy to the ear. It doesn't have a regional dialect. Which is amazing. Since yeah. I, you know, but I think it's because I came from the South, then spent time in New York, spent time in Chicago, Spent time in New Orleans and then back to New York. Plus, I grew up in a family where, you know, you, you had to speak English and you had to speak properly. And subject and verb agreement were very important. Yes. What was your uh, goal at that point? You know, now you're, now you're in the big leagues because you're in New York. You're at BLS, which was the number one station at that time. You also had your hand in the AM station. WLIB was the sister station of BLS, and then you started doing voiceover. What did, did you start when you were at BLS? Yeah, I started when I was at BLS. The first really big voiceover job I got, ironically, is one that I now have again, and I'm very excited about it. I don't know if you're familiar with a TV show called Night Flight that was on the USA yes. Network back in the 80s. Yes. It was a show that was on Friday and Saturday nights. It was all night mm -hmm. long, one of the first... Uh, cable shows that, that did music, actually mm -hmm. even uh, preceded MTV with doing music videos and we do what they call takeoffs to video. And I was the narrator of Night Flight. One of the producers of the show, Cynthia Friedland, heard me on WBLS and she said, that's the voice I want wow. for Night Flight. I had never heard of Night Flight. I didn't know who she was. <laughs> I did not really come from the rock world, which was what a lot of what they did, rock and punk and all this mm -hmm. other stuff. But yeah, I was always open to an opportunity and they hired me. I did the show for eight years wow. until they stopped doing it. And just recently, they're doing uh, Night Flight Reborn. They've got a, a web portal where oh, you can wow. get like the content because mm -hmm. it's great content, lots of interviews and movies and videos that, that they mm -hmm. owned, programs that they have produced and they still have all that. Stuart Shapiro, who was one of the other producers, acquired all of the night flight tapes and stuff. And now we're on the Independent Film Channel oh, doing wow. a, a night flight retrospective and they've hired me to come back and be the voice of night flight. Congratulations. Again. So it's kind of awesome. But that was good. That led to some work with HBO and Cinemax and a lot of other companies. I did not have an agent in New York. I was very fortunate that I just, that people heard me and I got a couple of really nice jobs. And you were the voice for Time Warner. For I was a, a voice for Time Warner Cable for many, many years. I mean, until just just recently, really. I was here for, in LA for, I would say about 10 or 12 years before that job stopped. I was still wow. doing Time Warner Cable. I was like on their phone lines also. Like you call, thank you for calling Time Warner Cable. Your call is important to us. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. But that was also a really good job to have. 
So in 40 years of doing radio, what are a few of your memorable experiences? I think one of the most significant things that ever happened in my career was when uh, Emmis took over CD 101.9 in New York. And after being there for about two or three years, they fired me. It was a horrible day, but it was one of the best things that could have ever happened to me because that's what led me to be able to come to Los Angeles, to go from market number one to market number two and to spend the bulk of my career in the two biggest markets in the country. That's pretty unbelievable. But when they fired me, it was God's timing. Uh, Dave Koz, a sax very talented saxophone player, who's a very good friend of mine, called me and he said, I heard you, what happened at CD 101. I was so sorry about that. He said, but what good timing? <laughs> because they had just offered him the morning show at The Wave here in Los Angeles, which was like this, the same format as CD 101 in New York. And he was looking for a co-host. And he had said, he told his people, oh, I wish I could get Pat Prescott. He said, but she will never leave New York. And he talked me into coming because I really wasn't going to come here. I got an offer from D.C. That's where I was going to go, D.C., because my brother lived there. My mom had moved back to Hampton at that time. You know, I was dating somebody in New York, and I was all my best friends were there and everything. So I said, no, this is better. I got an offer from Chicago. I was like, no, too cold. I already had that. But I came out here in February for the interview at The Wave. And it was 70 degrees. We went to Santa Monica and had lunch at Ecugini, sitting you there in. with the Pacific <laughs> Ocean right there. And, you know, and then Dave made all kinds of promises and stuff to me. And one of my best friends, she was living here, my friend Denise, and she says, you can come stay with us and we've got rental property and you could live there. And it was almost like God was just opening the doors saying, you know, you need to come to LA and this is where I've been for the last 17 years. And we're so happy you're here. I'm a night person with a morning job, okay? And I've been getting up at four o'clock in the morning for almost 40 years now and I'm tired of that. So I have started to look at what retirement is gonna be for me. I think I will always do something uh, in the business, maybe a part-time once, once a week air shift or something for Sirius or X, you know, Sirius XM or something like that. But I have recently gone back to teaching. Yes. I'm teaching broadcasting at Santa Monica College, Fantastic. which is something I always wanted to do in retirement. I just got an amazing voiceover opportunity. I'm the voice of the Hollywood Bowl on all of their radio spots now. This is the first season that we started that. It's something that I've tried to get for the last several years, so I'm pretty excited about doing that. I'm writing a book about how to have good relationships with everyone in your life. It's called The Wisdom to Know the Difference. Mm. And, you know, that is the real meat of the serenity prayer. Yes. The yes. wisdom to know the difference between yes. what you can change and, what you, and what you can't change. That's right. And the easiest thing to change is you. Right. <laughs> and so when you can concentrate on that, you can really have good relationships, I believe, with just about anyone. And uh, I've also had the opportunity to travel in the last 10 years or so. I got really, really lucky and I've gotten into a, a place where I am one of the people who is asked very often to host on a lot of travel experiences. The smooth jazz cruise I've done, the North Sea Jazz Festival cruise I've done. I do the Dave Cos cruise every year, which is incredible. We are traveling the world. Dave says seeing the world through music. I just did a Punta Cana jazz escape this past year. So I'm in that circuit now. Yes. That's something I want to keep doing because I love travel and I realize I'm not going to always want to get on a plane and take a long flight and, and all of that. I watch my mother now who's, you know, like like I said, almost 93, and she's about ready to relax and not do that anymore. And I see that will come. So this is a great opportunity. For yes. Me. What are several things that you try to get into your students about broadcasting? First of all, I want them to see what's really going on. So I'm bringing in a lot of guest speakers. I have asked everybody just about who works with me to come and speak. You have to have you come and speak at some to. point too. A lot of colleges now are really looking at what they call employability. How much is what we are teaching really preparing people for real jobs in today's real world? They're getting a program now that will teach podcasting. They want to teach the skills that people really need to have if they want to get a job today. Mm -hmm. I want to show young people what the real world of radio looks like. And it's not a whole lot like what you see in the book. The book has some great things in it, but there's some chapters in there I probably will skip because it's not really relevant. A lot of people think 
I'm going to be an announcer or I'm going to be a program director, but there's so many other jobs and I want them to be aware of all of those jobs. You might have great computer skills. You could be in IT. You know, you might be good at accounting. You know, you can work in the finance department or you might be a good writer. You know, you can work in, in copy and continuity. So you're in that environment. You're still around music and all of that. There are a lot of jobs. So yes. I've, been, I've brought in people from everywhere, from the street team all the way up to the general manager. They have all come to the class. Our um, radio group recently was acquired by Intercom from CBS. Oh. And Intercom is really passionate about radio. CBS wasn't so much. I mean, this was just another revenue stream for them. They're really focused on TV and right. film and all of that. So that it's was Viacom. Right, because mm -hmm. it's Viacom. But uh, Intercom coming in has been great. They put on the most amazing three-hour tour for my class for the last class of the semester. And it's going to be something that I'm going to do every year. And I also want to teach them the importance of having good people skills. So in every class, I'm going to talk about a little teeny book, which I think is amazing, called Skill with People, written by Les Giblin. It's real small, you can read it in one night, and the basic premise is something I said to you earlier. Nobody cares what you want, they only care what they want, and you need to figure out how to help people get what they want. Which means you have to talk to people, listen to them, ask questions about them and shut up. I mean, if you're willing to do more than others, you have an opportunity to be more than others. Since you've been out here and, and started at The Wave, you had a lot of male uh, co-hosts. What I loved that you did was you always gave them the platform. You always kind of took a little step back as to not overshadow them well, because I was, you could have. Well, in those situations, though, I was working with people who were not really disc jockeys. They were celebrities who were brought in to host a show because of their name recognition. And well, I worked with Brian McKnight for about uh, three years. And that was a wonderful experience because Brian played and sang and he just did his thing. He was amazing. But I had to really carry the broadcasting part. Just like with sports people now, you know. They'll have one person that was an athlete, but then the other person's a broadcaster because they know how to wrap things up and how to say things and how to put things in perspective. So that was my role. I mean, and I'm, I'm a team player at best. Dave Koz, um, I always tell Dave, you know, um, I taught him everything he knows, but not everything I know. <laughs> And I'm going to finally, Lydia, get to do something with my sports. I'm launching a sports podcast. Oh, yes. Yes, it's coming out very soon. Yes. And you'll know about it. All It'll right. be part of the Intercom uh, podcast platform. Excellent. Which is going to be wonderful because they're going to help to promote it and everything. And it's Excellent. called This Lady Loves Sports. And then you can finally put that book out, that sports book <laughs> that you wanted to put out. I do want to mention... Vi Higginson, yes. who was such an important influence on me. I mean, I think Allison Steele was at WNEW was the first woman I ever heard on the radio. And then when I went to college, I was in Chicago, and they had a station called WSDM, smack dab in the middle. It was right in the middle of the FM dial, and they had all-female wow. announcers. But Lamar Renee and Vi Higginson, because I did... Uh, grow up uh, the latter part of my life in New York and was really exposed to them. They were my major role models as women, and Vi later became a friend and also gave me the opportunity to work in her play, Mama, I Want to Sing. Which is I a was great for play. understudies, yes. a wonderful play. Yes. And I just love this woman, and I love what she has done post-radio with her life with the Mama Foundation, and she has remained so vibrant and just so wonderful, and I, I couldn't uh, let this time pass without really saying thank you uh, to Vi because she was amazing and to Anthony Wilson of course who gave me my first break and who is working in television now in North Carolina and I don't think I tell him enough how much his help has meant to me and his influence also as an announcement and program director.